This is how Emil Joseph Diemer played to frustrate his opponent. He decided to play just with his pawn so that his opponent gets irritated and confused. So, Diemer started the game with d4, knight to f6, f3, preparing the move e4, d6 by opponent and now e4, taking a strong control of the center squares. So beautiful these white pawns are. g6 by opponent, planning to fianche to his dark squared bishop. And now g4. His opponent is thinking, hey, maybe Diemer will castle on the queen side. So that is why he is expanding his king side pawns, which is fine. But he decides to castle king side anyway. So he plays bishop to g7. And now g5 by Diemer, attacking black's knight. The opponent Thomas Healing is now getting irritated. He's like, who plays such a move right in the opening? He doesn't pay much attention here and just moves the knight to the d7 square. And now f4 by Diemer, making sure that this pawn has a strong protection over here. Since white's pawn has taken such a strong control of the board on the center and on the king side, black decides to start challenging this strong central control with the move c5, attacking the d4 pawn. But Diemer is in no mood of exchanging any pawns here. So he plays d5. This is the seventh move of the game and Diemer is just playing with his pawns. D5 just grabs more space in the opponent's territory and makes black's life miserable. Thomas is like, fine, if you are expanding on the center and on the king side, I'm going to expand on the queen side. So he plays B5. But Diemer is like, hey dude, I'm not going to allow you to get any space or expand on the queen side because I'm going to stop you with the move C3, making sure your pawn doesn't move ahead. So A6 by Thomas is like, okay, fine, I will not move my pawn ahead, but at least I can give good support to my B5 pawn. And now h4 by Diemer is like, fine, since I have stopped the, all the queen side spawn, let me start expanding on the king side. And here Thomas is thinking probably Diemer will not expand his spawns anymore because looks like he has achieved his target of acquiring space in the center and on the king side of the board. So he focuses on repositioning this knight to a better place. So he moves it to the b6 square, which is not a great place, but at least, you know, moving this knight clears up the diagonal for this light squared bishop. So he thought this might be a good move. So knight to b6 by Thomas and now h5 by Diemer. What is he up to? Now, obviously, Thomas cannot capture the pawn back. Otherwise, he will mess up with his king's side pawn structure. So he thought of counter-attacking in the center with e6. But Diemer doesn't really care about this move. He's like, I'm going to make your life miserable and play h6. This is the 11th move of the game. And Diemer is just annoying his opponent with just his pawn moves. The bishop doesn't have any good squares to go. So the only square is bishop to f8. And now, after shutting down all the center and the king side activity of black, Diemer now starts attacking on the queen side. So he plays a4. And Thomas isn't really interested in capturing this pawn. He thinks that since white has successfully taken a lot of space on the center and on the king side of the board, uh, let me just start exchanging pawns in the center of the board. So he goes for e takes d5. And now, instead of capturing this pawn back, Dima decides to irritate his opponent one more time with the move a5. This is the 13th move in the game and Dima is just making his opponent's life miserable with just the pawn moves. Knight moves to the d7 square. Well, it went back to where it came from. And now Dima plays e takes d5. Such a good move. The knight now cannot capture back this pawn. And this pawn has entered into the black's territory, controlling these two key squares out of which the c6 square is a hole. Also not to forget, white also has got control of the b6 square, which is also a hole. So b6 is a hole, c6 is a hole, f6 is a hole, g7 is a hole. Black has four weak squares in his territory, which he really needs to take care of. Bishop to e7 by black. And now c4 by Diemer, challenging the pawn over here. Black plays f6, challenging white's king side pawns. But Diemer doesn't waste any time in calculating moves over here because his attention is on the queen side of the board. So he plays c takes b5, f takes g5. And now instead of capturing this pawn, Diemer plays 17th pawn move in the game. And that is f5, offering another pawn for free. Why? What's the idea? Let's see. So Thomas played pawn takes pawn. He was extremely irritated that all these pawns are heading in black's territory. So he just captured the pawn. But that wasn't a very good move because that pawn move just opened up this king side diagonal. And now Diemer finally started his attack with queen to h5 check. So after a series of 17 pawn moves, 
and violating so many opening chess principles, Demon now got his queen out straight into the opponent's territory to check the black king. What a daring move. King moved to f8, the only move, and now knight to f3. Triple attacking this pawn, which is currently defended by only two of black's pieces. So black added another defender by playing rook to g8, but that wasn't a good move because white is simply attacking and black is simply trying to defend. So when you are under such tremendous attack, you should try to counter attack. So what would have been a better move over here? Well, the best move over here in this situation would have been to play knight to f6, counter attacking white's queen and forcing the queen to retreat into its own territory. But unfortunately, Thomas missed this good move and ended up playing a defensive move, rook to g8, which is not very good. And now Demer played b6, grabbing some more space into the opponent's territory and especially the control of these two key squares. One is a7 and the other is c7, both of which are whole in black's territory. So if you look at it, black has many holes in his territory. One is a7, other is b6, another one is c6, c7, e6 and g7. All of these squares are holes in black's territory. They are weak squares. They cannot be controlled by any of black's spawns. That already shows how deadly all of these white spawns have proved to be in black's territory. Bishop to b7 by black and now Demer played knight to c3. Activating his other knight and now knight to f6 by Thomas. Attacking the queen but it's too late for that because Thomas came up with a brilliant move over here and that is knight takes g5. Well, what's the idea? Why is Demer sacrificing his queen? Well, Thomas didn't do his calculations well and fell for the trap. So he played knight takes queen and Demer responded with knight to e6 check, forking the black king and the queen. King moved to e8 and now knight takes queen, attacking the undefended bishop over here. And here Thomas had reached a point that he was quite annoyed with just playing defensive in his game. So instead of capturing this knight back with any of these pieces so as to protect this bishop over here, Thomas thought, so let me just counter attack my opponent. So he played knight to g3, forking both of these pieces. So what Thomas was saying that, hey, if you capture my free bishop over here, I'm going to capture a free rook over here and you're going to lose a lot of material that way. But Demer was like, as if I care, because my rook hasn't moved a single time in the game, it's just lying in its home square, isn't active and, and not doing anything much to attack black's king. So I don't care about my rook in the corner. But let me just get rid of one of your key defenders in your own territory. So Demer went on playing knight takes b7. Now do you understand why it's such a brilliant move? Because you just got rid of one of the key defenders in the black's territory. Thomas played knight takes rook, thinking that now he's up in material at least. But it's not going to help him a lot because Demer now played bishop to f4, double attacking this pawn over here. It's defended only by this bishop over here double attacking this pawn over here. It's currently defended only by this bishop over here. So to add one more defender, Thomas played rook to g6, protecting the pawn. And here Demer decided to castle queen side so that the king gets to the side of the board and he can bring one more piece in the attack against black's king. Knight to f2 by Thomas attacking the rook. Rook moved to e1, getting it on the same file as the black king. The king is definitely not feeling safe here. So he moved to the d7 square and now Demer played third brilliant move of the game and that is knight to b5. What's the idea? Why is he sacrificing another piece? Well, the idea is that before all of these other pieces get activated, Demer has to keep his attack going. And in order to open up lines for his light squared bishop and in order to give this square an access for his light squared bishop so as to attack the black king, he decided to sacrifice his knight. Such a brilliant creative move. And by the way, this game was played in the year 1984. Imagine how strong chess player Demer was in his time. Obviously, if pawn captures knight, then bishop takes pawn check. And if king moves to c8, then it would be a mate in 7. And if the opponent tries to block the check with his knight, then it would be a mate in 6. So let's go back. So therefore, his opponent did not capture back the knight, but rather played knight to e4. 
So what should Dima do now? His opponent totally refused to accept this sacrifice. So what should Dima do? So he thought, it's fine. If you don't want to accept my sacrifice over here, it's okay. I'm going to make another sacrifice. So he came up with the fourth brilliant move in the game. That is Rook takes Knight. Well, why is this move such a brilliant? Because if Pawn takes Rook, then again, the same idea we have is that the diagonal for this king would open up for the light squared bishop sitting over here. So the bishop would jump to the h3 square, checking the black king. King moves to e8 and now knight takes d6 check. If bishop takes knight, then knight takes knight check. King moves to e7 and now b7 attacking the rook. Rook moves to a7 and now knight to c8 check. Forking black's pieces and now king moves to f6 and now knight takes rook. Just loses material and from here onwards, Demer is already up in material by 2 points with a tremendous attack against black's pieces plus he has a very strong pass pawn over here so it's just a matter of few moves for Demer to finish off black's game so therefore let's go back therefore after this rook sacrifice his opponent did not capture back instead he played rook to g1 attacking and pinning this bishop to the white's king so Demer got his rook back to the e1 square unpinning the bishop and now Thomas realized how strong and deadly this bishop can prove to be. So therefore he decided to get rid of this piece. So he played rook takes bishop, rook takes rook and now pawn takes knight. So the idea was to capture two pieces and give up one rook for that, which was a sensible thing to do in such a situation. And here Demer played rook to g1, planning to get the rook on the seventh rank. King moved to c8. He doesn't want to be pinned over here. So knight takes d6 check. Bishop takes d6, bishop takes d6 and now knight to d7. Rook g8 check, king moved to b7, rook to g7. Pinning the knight to the black's king, king moved to c8. Rook takes pawn, clearing up the file for this pass pawn now. Rook takes a5, b7 check. If king moves over here, then the queen is coming and after the captures, Thomas will just go down in material. So king captured the pawn giving up his knight. So rook takes knight, check, king moved to c8 and now h7. Demer doesn't care about his pieces now. He's like, as long as the queen is coming on the board, I will get stronger anyway. So Thomas tries to do some counterplay with his rooks. So he plays rook to a1, check, king moves to c2 and now king takes rook, the pawn queens, king takes bishop, queen to d8, check, king to e5 and now d6. And Demer is already on its way to get another queen on the board. And at this point of time in the game, Thomas Healing resigned. So let me go back to the starting position. So did you see how Emil Joseph Demer break all the opening principles and just played with his pawns for up to 17 moves? It's like starting with d4 and then f3, e4, g4, g5, f4, d5, c3, h4, h5, h6. A4, A5, pawn takes pawn, C4, pawn takes pawn, F5 and then finally queen to H5 check. 17 pawn moves and not even stopping there but post that he played 4 brilliant moves starting with knight takes G5 sacrificing the queen first and then later knight takes B7 sacrificing a rook in the exchange and then playing knight to B5 offering another piece for a sacrifice and then rook takes knight sacrificing an exchange what does this tell you about this person well i'm definitely convinced that he was creative genius of his time who knew when to amend and break the principles of chess as per the situation on the board i'm sure you must have enjoyed watching this game so like this video and subscribe to my channel and now let's head on to the question of the day so here is a challenging position for you. White is up in material by 10 points, but black can finish off white's game in just four moves. So can you find the winning moves for black? Let me know your answers in the comments box and I'll see you in the next video.